<laughs> Hello and welcome. Uh, we're, we're so happy you can join us uh, today. In 2023, which is not that far off, uh, Jazz will celebrate five decades of bringing Japanese art and culture into the lives of thousands of people around the U.S. and the world. Uh, and what better way for us to mark this important 50-year milestone than to organize an exciting and very timely exhibition on 50 remarkable years in Japanese history, the Meiji period. Shortly, you'll hear from the key organizers of the exhibition, including the chair of the exhibition committee, JASA Vice President, Dr. Emily Sano, and the two co-curators, who Emily will introduce in a minute. I just wanna say a few words about Emily before I turn over the floor to her. We, we are so fortunate to have someone of her stature, experience, and scholarship leading this project. Many of you know Emily from her time as the director of the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, where she is now director, director emeritus. And she's serving now as well as the Coates Cowden Brown Senior Advisor for Asian Art at the San Antonio Museum of Art. So again, um, I just wanna say how grateful we are to her for taking the lead role uh, in making this exhibition a success. And, and the family, I wanna encourage everyone uh, to ask questions at the end of the presentation. We've left some time for you to speak your mind and probe our presenters on the plans. We wanna involve all our members in this wonderful project as we look forward to 50 more years, at least, of top-notch JAZA programs and initiatives. And now I'll turn it over to Emily. Thank you. Thank you, Wilson. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm pleased to be here tonight, and I'm so glad that you are joining us. The Japanese Art Society of America is eager to support the study of Japanese art through its lectures and programs that are open to all members. In addition to the programs ongoing throughout the year, JASA has undertaken a series of exhibitions. You may recall that in 2008, JASA organized the exhibition Designed for Pleasure to feature the aesthetics, social life, and commercialization of activities during Edo through its paintings, prints, and books. This time, JASA is looking forward to celebrating the 50th anniversary in 2023 with an exhibition called Meiji Modern, 50 Years of New Japan, devoted to the short-lived but important period following Edo. One of the earliest exhibitions devoted to the arts of the Meiji period was Imperial Japan, undertaken by the late Dr. Frederick Bakeland some 40 years ago in 1980. A smattering of other exhibitions have followed, but Meiji Modern will differ from those exhibits of the past by offering a new perspective on this era of Japanese art, providing a more complete picture of art during Meiji and not limited to a focus on export goods. This time we have chosen two young scholars who are passionate about Meiji to curate the exhibition. Professor Chelsea Foxwell of the University of Chicago and Dr. Bradley Bailey of the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston. We envision that the show will travel to at least three venues across the United States. Our goal is to show significant high quality works from the best collections in America. In the presentation you're about to see from the curators, we do include a number of objects that have not yet been requested for the exhibition, but they were chosen to share with you the caliber of works we wish to include. If you are a collector and you think you might have something that fits our themes, we will welcome your suggestions and questions. Before we proceed to the presentation, let's think for a moment about the time when the Emperor Meiji emerged after 300 years of rule by the Tokugawa shoguns. Pre-Meiji Japan was a feudal society where the large estates of land called Han were owned by daimyo lords and the Tokugawa ma maintained a strict social hierarchy. Daimyo were first, followed by the samurai, the peasants, artisans, 
and merchants at the bottom. Moreover, Japan's ports were closed and no one could come or leave. The early years of the 19th century were a turbulent period of social unrest, famine, and political maneuvering as Western boats appeared on the horizon. As you all know, Commodore Perry sailed into Edo Bay in 1853, demanding trade. And in spite of their fears, Japan realized they could not rebuff the American demands. And the Harris Treaty, signed in 1858, initiated commercial activities. Elsewhere in Asia at this time, in 1860, France and Britain it demanded that China legalize opium and they invaded Guangzhou and advanced into Beijing. They demanded and received preferential business treatment and control over ports. In Southeast Asia, in 1862, the French gained control over Vietnam and they succeeded by 1882 in colonizing Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. So clearly in 1868, as an isolated feudal society, Japan was at risk of colonization by European and American powers. The Meiji emperor restored to be head of state by rebellious daimyo and samurai in Southwestern Japan ended the shogunate. The emperor reformed the social structure and military. He weakened the samurai and freed the peasants from bondage. He built railroads, hospitals, universities, and also fostered trade and industrial growth based on a market economy, moving Japan from a feudal to a capitalist society. Thus Japan immediately shifted to creating a modern industrialized nation state, influenced by Western scientific, technological, political, legal, and aesthetic ideas and emerging as a great power. I'm astonished they could do it so fast, but our primary question tonight is what impact did this modernization have on art? So the, this question will be covered by um, Bradley and Chelsea, who will describe the major themes in Meiji Modern. I end here. Bradley, Chelsea. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, I, I, am, I think that was an excellent introduction to the period. And as uh, Emily said, Chelsea and I will be talking to you all about some of the, the objects that we feel represent the major themes and the overall caliber of objects, as well as the, the aesthetic of the show. Um, next slide, please. The title, uh, as Emily sort of explained, um, posits this period of Japanese history very much as a period of uh, a kind of modernity. Many times in the past, Meiji art especially has been regarded as derivative, made, often made for solely for foreign taste or foreign export, uh, when indeed the object that the object of this exhibition for Chelsea and myself is really to present uh, a period of almost an alternate modernity, a kind of redefined modernity, which we're calling Meiji modern. All of the incredible changes um, that Emily described are also um, outlined in a two volume compendium uh, from which the exhibition takes its subtitle, 50 Years of New Japan. Uh, the Meiji period is not precisely 50 years, but some of the developments that, uh, that spurred on these, uh, these, these major, major societal, artistic, economic changes also fall outside of the strict reign of the, the Emperor Meiji. So, by subtitling it 50 years of New Japan, we are also able really to provide a more comprehensive view of the period without tying it specifically 18, exactly 1868 to 1912, which would leave out some very important things. The compendium 50 years of New Japan, which was originally published in uh, 1904 in Japanese before being translated in 1909, you can see the cover image here, um, the, the frontispiece rather, 
50 Years of New Japan is the, the translation of Kaikoku Gojunenshi, so slightly, slightly different more. That's the, the opening, 50 years of it, kind of the history of an opening of a country. But it was compiled by uh, Count Okuma Shigenobu, who was a uh, finance minister, the second prime minister of Japan, and as you see in the image at left, uh, the founder of Waseda University, where his, a statue of him uh, is today. He is here presented on the right in all of his kind of Meiji regalia. But if doing research on him, you will find images of him in, in sort of traditional samurai garb. He was uh, from Saga. And he was schooled in Confucian classics as well as Rangaku or Dutch studies, kind of Western um, scientific study. And this book was at once a document of all of the, the incredible achievements that uh, Emily mentioned, uh, the establishment of a legal system uh, agrarian policy, economic systems, um, as to say nothing of the fine arts about which we'll talk in a moment. Um, and it's a, it's a major two volume set that was, that really does embody the spirit of Meiji modern. And it's not simply a historical document of these achievements of the period, but was also made to present to the outside world in a way, this, this, the achievements uh, of the Meiji period of this new Japan. And so we felt it was a, a great um, subtitle for this exhibition. And indeed, the second volume contains extensive accounts of Japan's artistic achievements of the period, which we hope this exhibition will embody. Next slide, please. So the fault that we, we would like to present just to you a few introductory slides to kind of introduce the aesthetic as we see it of the period before going into the major themes of the exhibition. And while the reign of the Emperor Meiji will not strictly define in a temporal sense this exhibition, the Emperor Meiji, of course, is a central figure, if not the central figure uh, of this period and of this triptych as well. Uh, this is by a Chika Nobu and is one of his so-called, we might call them enlightenment pictures. And one of the very, very interesting things about the period and about this transition from feudal Japan to uh, Meiji modern is prohibitions about the image of the emperor. Indeed, one traditionally was not even supposed to gaze directly upon the emperor. And in, in earlier depictions, he's sometimes shown behind kind of a semi diaphanous screen to hide his face. This, of course, becomes a problem when one is trying to establish a, a modern capitalist economy with the central monarch as a central figurehead in the style of perhaps, let's say, a, a Queen Victoria. The image of, of such a person must proliferate. And so we find um, many, many depictions of the Emperor Meiji. Uh, what is very, very interesting, you see him here in the central panel, as well as um, consorts and uh, the uh, who would become the Taisho Emperor, the young boy in the panel at right? He's often shown. Um, he's often shown in similar clothes and a similar pose, and indeed even on a very similar chair, indicating that while the image of him was important, uh, he was not seen by in, in person. He did not sit for this uh, portrait of Chikanobu. Uh, next slide, please. And we'll, we'll come back to, to, his, to his image. Uh, the, one of the other things that we really wanted to explore with this exhibition was how, despite the fact that this is often regarded as a, a strong break with traditional Japanese art, with traditional Japanese history, it is a period of rapid change, but it is a period that also sought in many ways to define and depict and revisit uh, the past. And to do so with, again, with a, a very modern eye in ways that um, really are technically masterful and extremely impressive. And as in the case of these three objects, often involve a traditional theme um, being executed in lavish materials with the highest technical prowess and very, very often a manipulation of these materials and a real mastery of these materials to, to almost to make them shift their physical state to appear as something else. So we find here three examples of um, the tide controlling jewel, a very important symbol in Japanese, uh, in Japanese culture and art, which is revisited in this period, um, shown amidst waves, breaking waves that kind of both embody naturalism, but also have abstract and very modern qualities, but that have been hammered out of silver, very fine jungin silver. And these pieces, as we can see, going from right to left, they, they in many ways grow increasingly elaborate with the piece at Cleveland having an extra, uh, extra rock crystal orbs as well as what appears to be a, a shakudo dragon swirling amidst the waves. 
uh, before this wonderful uh, private collection piece on the far left, uh, where we actually have a, a cast bronze rock, as well as pins of silver and gold and uh, patinated metals that simulate kind of foam um, and bubbles on these, on these waves that have been hammered from a sheet of silver, producing something that looks like liquid in motion from what is in fact, of course, a very uh, hard metal. Another aspect of this that does embody Meiji Modern is the marrying of this highly refined and highly technical, in many ways wrought uh, aesthetic and manipulation of materials with the natural. Uh, and of course, these are not glass orbs, they are rock crystal orbs that were found and, and were polished and shaped and cherished for being blemish, blemish free and here given these incredibly elegant stands. Uh, this revisiting of classical themes is something that we think will allow the general public to approach this exhibition without, without feeling the need to necessarily be a specialist in late 19th century Japan, but just having some familiarity with Japanese culture and art. Next slide, please. Good evening, everyone. It's great to see you, and thanks, Bradley. Uh, picking up here with an introduction of some of our general themes, um, the Meiji period was also significant for the way in which it rethought uh, the Japanese past and, and rethought time. Uh, in this triptych by Yoshitoshi, we see Saigo Takamori seated on the right, the leader of the Satsuma Rebellion of 1877. Brandishing swords, the samurai rebels under Saigo's command fought the Meiji government's new army of conscript soldiers in southern Kyushu. This civil war continued for the better part of a year and was reported back to Tokyo and other cities through newspapers and represented in many woodblock prints. Saigo and his army are shown as heroic embodiments of traditional samurai valor, although in prints they also sport a handsome Western style uniforms. Saigo and his men were eventually defeated with Saigo being wounded in battle and reportedly also committing seppuku to avoid capture by his enemies. Although the public understood that Saigo was engaged in the criminal act of leading an anti-government rebellion and that he was therefore doomed to die, Woodblock Prince of the Satsuma Rebellion overwhelmingly present him and his forces as protagonists in a conscious juxtaposition between traditional samurai values and the modern, um, uh, modern manifestations of the new government. In 1889, just a dozen years after Saigo's death and the defeat of this insurrection, however, the Meiji government actually pardoned Saigo, restored his imperial rank, and even erected a bronze statue of him in Ueno Park. Next slide, please. This print by Watanabe Nobukazu shows fashionable ladies and a boy in a modern sailor uniform and other people who are strolling under the cherry blossoms in Ueno Park as onlookers gaze at the new statue of Saigo um, on the right and uh, read the inscription that tells of his good deeds uh, prior to the Satsuma Rebellion. Uh, the woodblock print is of course an art form that had been continued from the Edo period, although with all sorts of new uh, and continual advances throughout the Meiji, first half of the Meiji period. Uh, but here it's being used to present a new art form uh, the commemorative bronze statue, which like the public park, represented this new form of civic engagement for Meiji subjects that were now thoroughly incorporated into the modern lifestyle. And you can see some you know, hints of, of this modern lifestyle with the trench coats and uh, umbrellas and uh, hats and military uniforms. So uh, many Meiji objects uh, similarly show this ability to kind of reflect on the past and the present in a single work of art. Next slide, please. It's very interesting to, to look at the, the, the aesthetic of the period and to try and trace the development, uh, some of the things that Chelsea just mentioned, as well as some of the things that Emily delineated, because they did happen in a very, very short period of time. One of the ways that we hope to express this in the exhibition is by showing not only the encounter with the new and the, and the foreign, the literally imported, the, the literally never before seen uh, at the beginning of the Meiji period, but to show how some of these ideas, concepts, and literal things, uh, literal, literal animals in this case, were incorporated into the Meiji aesthetic 
and indeed uh, mastered uh, and and uh, almost I, I say almost nativized um, and blended into pre-existing tradition. So one example, of course, is shown here on the left. Many of you who are familiar with Yokohama prints have probably seen this juxtaposition of an elephant and Dutch people or other foreigners. Um, this is because these are both new and, and foreign, uh, foreign things, um, foreign mammals, we should say. Uh, elephants, of course, exist in Japanese art going back many centuries before this. But what we have here is a distinct effort on behalf of Yoshiiku to depict uh, a true elephant. And not only um, an elephant as seen with the naked eye, because it's sort of obvious that that is not the case, but uh, an elephant as depicted in photographs, also a new, a new technology, a new imported technology. Indeed, looking at the frame of the print on the left, you see a conscious effort to emulate a period photograph. This also comes across in the shading of the elephant, this, this high relief that is meant to simulate in woodblock print the effects of, say, um, say an albumin and, a, and the flash of a camera. Uh, further emphasizing this is the, the name of the, the, the title of the print, Shashinkyo, uh, coming from, um, deriving from the same root as a picture, Shashin, a true, true image. Uh, but this, this work has been coated with beeswax to give it the sheen of a photograph or albumin. Now, only approximately 40 years later, less than 40 years later, we now have an image very similar to the, the print that Chelsea just showed in that it, it takes place in Ueno Park, uh, this time with an actual elephant. Uh, by this point, the zoo had opened and there was an actual elephant. And I think that we can all agree that Miyagawa Shunte's depiction here uh, is, is probably one that was rendered with the naked eye and without the mitigation of a camera, at least overtly. We do have photographic effects, however, if we look at the shading, the Bokashi effect on the elephant. And this is a way that the, the Meiji naturalism was, was heightened and foreign objects were, and foreign techniques were simultaneously incorporated into new, or into a rather existing artistic um, media. I would also like to mention that the print on the right belonged to Bill Green and was given to Amherst College along with over 4,000 other uh, of his works. And many of you, of course, know that Bill Green founded the Ukiyo-e Society of America, the forerunner to uh, the Japanese Art Society of America. And so we hope to be able to include this and perhaps other works uh, from his collection to represent not only the Meiji period, but the history of JASA as well. Next slide, please. The end point of the exhibition prevent, presents the arrival at a self-confidently modern style. The intricate patterns and colors of early Meiji design increasingly give way to a pared down aesthetic where a limited number of colors and stylized natural forms create an elegant and contemplative atmosphere. Many of these works continue to be based on the same types of natural forms that graced earlier Japanese art. Uh, so, um, but uh, they take a different form in these works. So you have the bamboo in a screen by Tsuji Kako and a porcelain vase by Makuzu Kozan. Both of these works avoid heavy ink outlines uh, and instead feature delicate, delicate gradations of color. They're also significant in their choice of just a single color in each and their emphasis on the vertical stalks of the bamboo, which emphasize the verticality of the porcelain vase and of the screen. These works are conversant in the Art Nouveau style that flourished in Europe and throughout the world between 1890 and roughly 1920, and which was in turn heavily inspired by Japanese art. So Meiji Modern represents a point at which Japanese art and craft becomes self-assured, restrained, uh, sophisticated, and conversant in the, late, late, in the latest European design trends, as well as having that um, confident uh, and really pioneering treatment of a lot of different materials and um, uh, in craft and painting, sculpture. For Japanese viewers, uh, the luxuriant groves of bamboo on these works might have also evoked the story of the bamboo cutter's daughter, where a childless old man miraculously finds a baby girl in a stalk of bamboo. So these works also had multiple meanings and uh, were open to different types of interpretations by different audiences. Next slide, please. 
Excellent. So one of the that's an excellent transition because one of the the ways that we hope to really enliven these works for for people and for the general public is to show precisely what uh, Chelsea just illustrated is the reproduction of or and revisiting rather representation of many of these themes and motifs across different media. So um, we are overall going to organize the the exhibition around uh, a few core themes. Uh, one, one of them is we're calling right now, it's simply men and women, and it's about the changing societal roles of men and women, be it samurai to soldier or um, kimono to uh, French dress uh, or many, many others. And so we're very, very fortunate. As I said, many of the images of the emperor derive from a few core uh, images, um, such as this work by, from, by Uchida on the right. You'll notice this, the same outfit, the same pose, very similar chair as in the Chikanobu work that we saw. But we're also fortunate to have found uh, with private collectors, the incredible um, recently acquired Chokuninkan court ensemble on the left, which is obviously derived from European, perhaps French examples and contains not a samurai sword, but this uh, very European style sword uh, a hat uh, complete with ostrich feathers and extensive gold brocade with um, a Tokugawa motif, Tokugawa Mon motif on it, which does of course recall, uh, recall history but presents it in an entirely different way. And we are hopeful that by showing um, images and then physical objects that, that repeat similar motifs, uh, we will really enliven this material for the viewers and help transport them to the Meiji period. Next slide, please. Similarly, um, some of these images refer reference history, but do so in an incredibly modern way, such as another Uchida work, this time of uh, Empress Consort Haruko on the left. Um, I believe in this year, the Empress issued an edict about uh, the wearing of clothes and how these Heian period robes, which were uh, regarded as more, more traditionally Japanese with less continental influence, were actually more practical and somehow modern. Um, however, it's worth noting that this, this kind of historical revival is, of course, represented with an incredible new technology. Um, again, we, in a span of 30 years, we see an incredible change with the Couchier print on the right, the, the frontispiece by Taku Chikeshu, um, which itself is the, even the medium that in which it exists is a development of the Meiji period and increased um, women's literacy from educational reforms. But what we see here again is the changing role uh, of the woman in the Meiji period as represented not only in image, but in her clothes with this red cross uniform. And it's worth noting that by this point, by 1904, um, the Japanese red cross was actually the largest red cross in the world, second only to the United States. So the, we hope uh, by juxtaposing images like this that we are able to really express uh, these, these shifting roles for men and women. Next slide, please. But as we have seen in some of the, the images that Chelsea has shown, the, the fact that um, these changes happen in such a rapid, in such a real, really relatively short period of time, we also hope to illustrate what might be termed kind of the, not necessarily growing pains, but some of the, the effects of these, of these changes as they happen. And so something that you'll see very commonly as in this, this other Takuchi Keishu frontispiece on the left is a woman in a traditional outfit, um, whereas a man is wearing a bowler hat uh, and that, that trench coat that we saw in Ueno Park. An interesting facet, as I mentioned earlier, is also this material manipulation and imitation. And so it's fascinating to put an image, uh, the print like the one on the left with it, with the work like the one on the right, the Shokosai, the first bowler hat um, in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, represents, again, this, this kind of adaptation to the new using, um, using high material manipulation traditional and traditional um, technique. Next slide, please. This is further emphasized uh, with the by the introduction of, of new technologies and new reproductive technologies, as well as new artistic techniques. Uh, on the left, we see a poster for the Mitsukoshi department store, uh, which is a lithograph. You'll notice that though she, the, the model is in a very traditional um, kimono, she does sit atop in arts and crafts, almost Christopher Dresser inspired, um, inspired seat. 
the shading of her face as well belies this as a, as a lithograph, really shows that um, near photographic influence. And of course, she is still looking at ukiyo-e um, woodblock prints but have, that have here been reproduced in this new medium, this, this lithograph. On the right, we are very fortunate with the help of Sebastian Izzard to locate a very beautiful um, oil painting. The Meiji period, of course, represents also the establishment of technical uh, fine art training in the European kind of studio style uh, and the really widespread introduction um, of the practice of oil painting. And so here we have, again, a, a traditional scene, but that does show, as Chelsea has mentioned, engagement with larger, um, larger themes and even um, an almost impressionistic uh, style as this, this uh, young lady kind of gazes off, but still has a very uh, attenuated, um, almost Ang style, uh, style hand. But it's a really beautiful work and we're very uh, excited to be able to include it, not only to represent um, the female image, but also increased availability uh, to artists of materials, techniques, and source imagery. Next slide, please. A second theme uh, that I've sort of hit on is uh, sea and ships. Uh, the sea has always been important for Japan. Uh, it's almost, I believe, 70% mountains. There's very little arable land. So the sea has not only been a source of sustenance, but also, of course, is the source of objects from abroad. Um, this print, this pentaptic really represents uh, one of the finest, if not the finest Yokohama compositions that I've ever seen. Uh, it's production, the technique, uh, the materials and the condition are all extraordinarily impressive. And it's a, uh, in these five panels, we see, we see foreigners from the five different nations, their flags flying and those black ships that Emily had mentioned kind of uh, cutting through the waves. Another very interesting innovation can be seen in the rightmost panel where we see uh, Sadehide approximating using a, a faintly printed, overprinted blue rather, uh, glass windows in the European ship. Next slide, please. Again, this in, in a single period, we have incredible adaptation, not only artistic, but technological. So only uh, just over 40 years later, of course, we now have Japanese ships uh, which are no longer wooden, but are great warships made of iron and um, steel. And this composition as well is strikingly modern. We see the shafts of light uh, cutting across the various panels, as well as Bokashi here being used to convey in almost an atmospheric perspective, the smoke of battle. Um, and finally, um, with the uh, finally, um, a truly, to make this production even more lavish, the, the fleck and the spattering of gofun uh, to create ocean spray or maybe even falling snow across the, the five panels. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, we are really keen on showing the, um, the trans translation, really, of these various themes across different media. And one of the great innovations uh, during this period are these very almost photorealistic embroidery compositions. Um, and so here we have a piece uh, by Hashi, Hashi Kyoshi uh, depicting the sea that is not only exemplary in its technical refinement and technical mastery, but also strikingly modern in its, um, in its, in its composition, the use of negative space and the really um, simplification and self-confidence of a single theme as Chelsea has explained. Next slide, please. Um, and finally, as I mentioned, the sea will also uh, include um, some seaside scenes because, again, it was a source of sustenance, um, a major source of sustenance um, throughout, it remains so today. And I think that these two images really do embody the two poles that we have really um, trying to, been trying to get at. The private collection work on the left, uh, the two panel screen by Shibata Zeshin, is of course a lacquer painting which again is strikingly modern in its spare composition and almost uh, very strongly abbreviated forms, but also in its wonderful and incredibly uh, refined manipulation of the lacquer, um, lacquer surface to simulate not only seashells, but also this kind of sandy texture of the, the seaside. 
at Riot is a work by uh, an artist named Ganho that expresses really this high degree of Meiji naturalism. It is on um, it is on silk and uses very fine mineral pigments as well as you can't tell from this photo, but as well as extensive use of of mica, so the fish actually gleam. Uh, further, though, to emphasize the engagement of uh, tradition and the revisiting of tradition, but using very technically refined and even um, somewhat deceptive skill. It's difficult to see in this image, but though it's painted on silk, there are very fine, uh, fine lines running across the back that make it appear as though it has been painted on five sheets of paper, a reference to uh, the construction of an early Edo period screen. Chelsea? Thanks, Bradley. I love how there are so many different um, manifestations of the sea and we've seen uh, from that early pentaptic by Sarahide to the um, military print, um, they use such different techniques within the woodblock medium, but they're both, um, they're both really striking compositions. Next slide, please. Our next theme is flora and fauna, um, but we have a transition from the sea with these two works that continue to refer to the sea. So of course, you know that depictions of the natural world already dominated out of period art. And in Meiji art, um, we see an extension of those continuities. Uh, while we also see this quest for ever greater heights of naturalism. The proliferation of works with animals, birds, and sea life uh, reflects an awareness uh, that these images and objects, I think, were particularly accessible to international audiences because there were no complex iconography to master. And meanwhile, we have many comments from Western viewers and connoisseurs um, from the time period, the late 19th century, um, marveling at the different approach to nature that they see in these Japanese works, which was uh, something not the same as what they were accustomed to seeing in Western art. Um, so these works also express uh, incredible technical mastery and excitement about the potential of particular mediums, uh, whether it be uh, this ironworking or cloisonne that you see on the right. Um, and uh, there's this kind of exploration of uh, the interaction between two-dimensional and three-dimensional, between things to look at and things to touch. Don't we all just want to play with this, uh, with this spiny lobster uh, articulated okimono? Uh, so this uh, spiny lobster is Issei Ebi in Japanese, uh, and it represents uh, uh, something that was typically used as an auspicious New Year's motif. Um, as well as a part of cuisine for the new year. And uh, so the uh, articulated iron figurine could be posed, it could be juxtaposed, we know from records of the time period with flower arrangements or with other items in a tokonoma to create a kind of um, intriguing seasonal display. Um, and these were of course also quite popular at the time among foreign collectors. Um, the Cloisonne Vase by Ando Jube uses different degrees of luster to bring out the raised forms of the Isayabi in a sumptuous brick red. And so uh, this uh, vessel also uses a special raised or moriage technique that involved painstaking burnishing and reapplication of layers of enamel to masterfully recreate the exoskeleton of this crustacean. And so uh, these types of things uh, were, uh, I think they bring delight to viewers today and they were designed to bring, you know, delight to all sorts of viewers at the time, regardless of their, uh, you know, background, young or old or Japanese or foreign. Next slide, please. We also see um, paintings that involve new takes on naturalism. Uh, these uh, images are part of a set of album leaves on silk uh, by the master Watanabe Seite uh, in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, uh, and uh, these, uh, Seite was one of the first li living Japanese artists to gain recognition in Paris in his time. And he was also incredibly popular among Japanese patrons to the extent that 
for the latter part of his career, he rarely participated in competitions or in international exhibitions because he had so many patrons in Japan. Next slide, please. In this cloisonné panel, Nami Kawasosuke uses enamels to capture the essence of a painting by Watanabe Seite. So here you can see the dialogue between the arts and the way that uh, craft is drawing on new developments in Meiji art. So um, Sosuke, Namikawa Sosuke uses enamel to try to express the way that the snow clings to the pine needles here without using heavy wire outlines, the same way as Watanabe Seite avoided using you know, these harsh ink outlines uh, to make his bird's uh, uh, feathers look so soft and approachable. Next slide, please. Our final thematic section that we wanna highlight here is history and myth. Uh, deities and time-honored tales and figures from Buddhism and Shinto continue to be a major uh, theme for paintings in the Meiji period. And these are just um, an example of the type of works that we would love to include in the exhibition. Uh, you see the hell courtesan with the monk EQ by Kyosai in the left from the Weston collection. And um, Ben Ten or Ben Zai Ten, uh, who's shown riding a dragon by Hashimoto Gaho on the right. Gaho's painting on the right was purchased directly from the artist in the Meiji period, so in the mid 1880s, by the American William Sturgis Bigelow, who and donated to the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. And uh, when this, these paintings were received in Boston, then it was an example of living artists being museumified in their own time period and quite you know, early on in the Meiji period. Um, and so the, there was incredible foresight of these uh, American collectors and other international figures who um, knew that Japanese art belonged in dialogue with the great works of Western art that uh, completely dominated you know, museum interiors in those days. And you also had uh, figures like Arthur Wesley Dow or Ernest Fenollosa or Okakura Kakuzo who uh, wrote and also gave speeches to argue quite eloquently why Japanese art um, of this time period and of all time periods deserved to be you know, considered in the same gallery space as the great works of Western tradition that people were familiar um, with at the, as considering as fine art at this time period. Um, going back to Kyosai's hell courtesan on the left, uh, we can see the monk Iq, uh, who is famous for uh, visiting the brothel and having a discourse about the meaning of life and death uh, with uh, the hell courtesan and also ecstatically dancing. Uh, so he was glimpsed dancing with these skeletons and skeletons of course are um, ubiquitous within Meiji art. We see them a lot because uh, and the one hand, they represent this quest for the, an increasingly accurate knowledge of the human anatomy, um, skeletal system. Um, at the same time that skeletons were related to biology and accuracy and anatomy, uh, they were also related to the love of the occult and of the spooky. And uh, that there, they were a representation that there were things in this world that couldn't just be explained by science and by rationality. And so uh, we get maybe the both sides of, of this approach to the skeleton in Meiji art. Next slide, please. Uh, we see also these time-honored themes from history and myth in three-dimensional objects, uh, such as this large figural grouping in bronze uh, from the Dallas Museum of Art. Uh, it shows the mythical general Takeuchi no Sukune, who's receiving the tide controlling jewel. So you remember the crystal ball and the waves from the earlier um, examples that Bradley showed. Here we see them again. And uh, this uh, tide controlling jewel was used to subdue the seas within Takeunuchi's battle. So this would allow him to be victorious in battle. And so this work also shows us how um, a very contemporary Meiji ambitions, such as becoming a world power, were also expressed through these classical themes. Uh, if we think about uh, Takeunuchi's uh, stature as an ancient general. Next slide, please. 
Uh, so uh, there are many more works that we um, have been thinking about in uh, planning this exhibition and putting together a preliminary checklist um, that we hope to approach uh, collectors and institutions with. Um, and we're really hoping to show that there are so many um, delicate resonances between individual works. So here on the left, you see uh, this um, hawk who's glaring at its reflection in a waterfall. So this is a diptych or rather a pair of hanging scrolls. And so you can see this idea of representation in painting uh, being thoughtfully represented um, on, a, on the level of the natural world of we're looking at the painting and the hawk is also looking at its own reflection. Uh, and uh, wouldn't it be great to pair a work like that with um, Aoki Tomonobu's uh, kestrel here, which is a koro or an incense burner. Uh, so we have this uh, masterful um, working of silver and shakudo and even gold and other uh, metals um, show this incredibly realistic uh, kestrel who seems once again very aware of uh, us who are looking back at him. Next slide, please. So I guess now it's now it's time for us to reflect and see if there are any questions. Thank you both so much. Um, we are going to start off with a question that was sent in uh, from a JASA member. Are there any historic or documentary objects from American museums that may be solicited for loan for this exhibition? Uh, well, the, the gaho that Chelsea uh, spoke about is, is one such object, but in our, in our research, we have found many, many uh, others, a few truly impressive pieces that were acquired during, during the period uh, as modern art, as contemporary art. Um, and so we are hopeful to, to borrow them. Interestingly, and I, I don't know how Chelsea feels about this, but interestingly, uh, you know, we find at the time, museums, it wasn't only art museums that were collecting it because it was a non-Western culture. Sometimes in natural history museums, you can find truly extraordinary pieces of Japanese art that really represent um, Japanese industry and craft. And so we have also been fortunate to uh, find pieces um, such as the uh, a, a large tapestry in the Field Museum that uh, we hope we will find a venue large enough to show in. Um, but I'm sure, but there are, yes, there are many, many such objects. Yes, and this exhibition shows 50 years of the Meiji, but it also commemorates 50 years of JASA and of uh, this uh, Art Society of America that has been collecting in America Japanese art. And so many of these historic objects represent the history of that relationship of American collectors falling in love with Japanese objects. And so uh, that's another aspect of reflexivity in this exhibition. Um, we're not, our exhibition is not limited to showing how foreigners appreciated Japanese art. We also want to show, um, you know, works of art, including tea utensils that were appreciated by um, Meiji Japanese people, uh, but certainly commemorating this relationship, um, you know, between Japan and America is something that we want to do. Wonderful. Thank you so much. There's a question from Vincent Cavello. He says, wonderful talk, one quick question. The Kiyoshi screen showing waves that was shown was dated 1915. Can you discuss the reason for including this piece within the Meiji time period? Uh, yeah, I, there are really two, two aspects to, it, to this answer. The first is that we did not want to limit ourselves strictly to um, you know, the Meiji restoration and the death of the emperor Meiji. But uh, in the specific case of that work, uh, because of its complexity and the, the 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 nature of the process of making such an embroidery and mounting it as a as a screen like that, uh, the planning for it and the production of it would have been begun well well within the the bounds of the the Meiji period. So, and that date that date is probably the date that it was kind of um, that it made its debut as a finished piece. Uh, but the actual planning and execution and indeed the really the style of it are very evocative of the, this kind of self-assured late Meiji aesthetic that we are hoping to, to show. But yes, good catch. 
Thank you so much. Um, there is another question someone sent in. We have a question from a JASA member who wants to know what the budget for the exhibition is and how it will be funded. Can we, let's pass this one to Emily. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, um, our initial budget uh, for this show is a half million dollars, 500,000. Now um, that, that may go up, uh, but that's what we're working with at the moment. It's fortunate that the uh, JASA Board of Trustees has already established a fund devoted to the 50th anniversary exhibition. And we've received a generous support to start the process of um, funding such an ambitious show. The, the costs are high because the objects are scattered all over the country and the packing, shipping and insurance uh, will be quite expensive uh, for this exhibition. But uh, we hope that we can ca call to our membership, that is all of you to help support us. And we would appreciate so much if you could see your way to making a multi-year pledge uh, to help support this really groundbreaking exhibition. Thank you, Emily. Um, there's a question from Erwin Lavenberg. He says, would you comment on the work of Kiyo Chika and Chika Nobu, both with samurai backgrounds and the internal tension they displayed in their work between the pre-Meiji world of samurai privilege and Meiji modern? That's a, it's a great Sorry. question. I have, I have uh, my thoughts. Pre-Meiji pre world of samurai, okay. So Kiyo Chika, uh, who, uh, I don't think we got to include today, right? He, we're hoping to include some of his mm -hmm. uh, iconic and really pioneering uh, woodblock print depictions of the city of Tokyo. And, and those works fit well with the themes that we've been talking today because they, about today because they, um, they show a, a sort of lyricism that uh, relates to, but is different from the lyricism of Hiroshige's works. Um, but at the same time, Kiyochika experimented with, um, you know, print and his his print his publisher his printers experimented with uh, different printing techniques. Uh, Chikanobu, uh, but uh, Kiyochika also did a lot of you know satirical works and so forth. And so um, I do I see him more as a kind of you know every man's view of Tokyo. I don't know if you would agree, Bradley. With uh, whereas mm. Chikanobu. Uh, he is so polished and um, when he contributed paintings, for example, to the Chicago World's Fair of 1893, he, he showed um, an elegantly attired what looked to be a samurai mother and daughter. So uh, even though uh, as a, a picture of Bijinga, it would have been much more familiar in the Edo period that these would be shown as courtesans. But uh, it seems you're right that I think if I can uh, sense behind this question that Chikanobu had a sense of samurai decorum that he brought into the um, Meiji period with him. And I just glimpsed from the chat that there was another question asking about um, whether the status of, of popular objects and popular imagery and whether we'll be able to include those. And, and certainly it's interesting that even though Chikanobu was working in a popular medium, the woodblock print, and you know, on some of these prints, you can see that they sold what they sold for, you know, just a few cents, sen. And then, um, so there's this popular uh, element, but yet within the subject matter of his prints, it's all about the gorgeousness of the upper classes and, and of preserving some kind of a samurai uh, background. So, um, yeah, that's what I can say for now. I'd like to think more about the question as well. Bradley, I don't know if you had something to add. No, I, I think it's an excellent question. And I think that uh, our focus though with, with the exhibition will be, on, will be on them. And I saw someone else mentioned Ogata Gekko. And our focus is uh, that we will, you know, we would love to include works by them, but we are also trying to fit them into our, our themes. And so, we some someone like Chikanobu, for example, I, I think that like the say the Chiyoda Palace series would be less appropriate for for our exhibition than some of his work with um, these so-called Enlightenment pictures, uh, you know, or, or images of the Rokumeikan, because we we are using them very much to show, um, hopefully, in a single image, 
um, the, the the changes taking place and kind of the 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 uh, the two these two aesthetic impulses that we're, that we're trying to embody with this exhibition and not necessarily so much um, pure nostalgia for for the, the the past but I I think that that's a very interesting idea and we we do you know by including these kind of canonical themes and and structuring the exhibition around these ubiquitous motifs we are hoping to express some of that. Um, some of that nostalgia, but there are many figures as well in the show who who do make that um, who do have samurai past, including, as I said, Count Okuma. So, oh, thank you. Oh yeah. gosh, how exciting! Well, uh, this has been wonderful, uh, and I'm so glad that the audience uh, seems to be uh, full of people who have knowledge of the area and uh, lots of questions to ask. Uh, we pr propose. We have to conclude. So we propose that you uh, pay attention to that, that email address and use it. You can continue to ask questions of the curators. I should mention that uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Chelsea Foxwell is a, uh, got her PhD from Columbia University. She is actually one of the best published scholars in the field of Meiji. So she must have started very young. And Bradley, too, uh, Kerry had his interests uh, fostered at Yale, where he got his PhD. He also worked at the Ackland Art Museum in, at the University of North Carolina. And they, while his, he was there, they managed to collect a number of fantastic pieces of the Meiji period. So clearly his, his passion uh, came out uh, early on as well. Uh, I'd like to thank them, uh, as well as members of the exhibition committee who are with, with us this evening, uh, including Leo Robinson, who is our project manager, and Helen Goldenberg. You did a wonderful job, Helen. Thank you in helping us with our webinar. Uh, I would wish to express our deep appreciation to our trustees, our past presidents, our members like you and supporters, who have championed the subject of Meiji art for this future celebratory year. This evening has been a preliminary introduction. Uh, we hope to have your responses and uh, ideas and uh, please make use of that Meiji at JapaneseArtSock.org. So we look forward to continuing our discussion. I want to remind you that there will be another JASA webinar coming up on November 19th. Uh, when we will welcome Dr. Jeannie Kenmotsu, the Japan Foundation Associate Curator of Japanese Art and Interim Head of Asian Art at the Portland Art Museum. She will speak on a documentary exhibition she is working on on Japanese women printmakers of the 1950s and 60s. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us and um, we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for all your questions and comments. <laughs>